Hey everyone, this lesson is on the antiviral known as remdesivir. In this lesson, we're going to talk about remdesivir, including its mechanism of action, adverse effects caused by remdesivir, and we're also going to talk about what we know so far about its effects against coronaviruses like the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. So what is remdesivir? Remdesivir is an antiviral agent, but more specifically, it is a pro-drug of something we call GS441524. So what does all of that mean? So remdesivir is a prodrug. A prodrug is an inactive form of the medication. And when it is administered into the body, it becomes metabolized into an active form of the medication. And the active form in this case is this GS441524. You don't need to remember this. There are a lot of numbers here. But what GS441524 is, is it is an adenosine analog. So what does that mean? Adenosine is a nucleoside base, which is a nucleotide base without a phosphate group. These are the building blocks that are used to create or produce nucleic acids like RNA and DNA. And an analog is, you can think of it as a mimic. It's not the real thing. It looks like the real thing, but it is not. That is what an adenosine analog is is. It looks like adenosine, but it is not the same as the true adenosine. So we're going to talk about all of this in more detail in the next slide. So remdesivir was originally produced to treat Ebola virus infections. There may be some use for treatment of Marburg virus infections as well, but it was mostly produced to treat Ebola viruses, especially during the Ebola virus outbreak several years ago. So what was found was that it was not very effective in treating Ebola viruses. Other medications were better able to treat Ebola viruses, so it is rarely used. But when it is used, it is given parenterally, which means that it is given through IV administration, not through oral administration, but through intravenous administration. It is also manufactured by the company Gilead, and as I mentioned before, it acts as a nucleotide analog to inhibit RNA synthesis. So we're going to talk about all of this in more detail in the next slide. What are some of the adverse effects of remdesivir? Some of these include nausea and vomiting. So these are oftentimes more common side effects of remdesivir use. And remdesivir also causes something we call transaminitis. Transaminitis is a term we use to indicate an elevation of liver enzymes. We use the term transaminitis because the liver enzymes are transaminases. So transaminitis means an increase in liver enzymes. This might indicate injury or damage to the liver caused by remdesivir. And more recently, remdesivir has been discussed as a possible treatment for COVID-19 because of in vitro data showing that remdesivir has some antiviral properties against SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. There's also some older data that shows remdesivir has some antiviral effects on other coronaviruses like SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. And this data was originally shown in a paper published in February of 2020 in Cell Research entitled Remdesivir and Chloroquine Effectively Inhibit the Recently Emerged Novel Coronavirus 2019 NCOV in Vitro. So 2019 NCOV has been renamed to be SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And what's key here is that this data is in vitro. So in vitro means that it is in a petri dish, in a cell culture dish, only in certain types of cells. So this has not been shown in humans yet. There are some clinical trials ongoing, but right now we're only in the preliminary stages of researching remdesivir and its effects against SARS-CoV-2. So I'm now going to discuss what we know so far from in vitro data about remdesivir's antiviral properties against coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2. So before I begin, here is the cell membrane, and here's inside the cell, here's the nucleus of the cell with DNA inside the nucleus. So the mechanism of action has been described in this article here entitled Coronavirus Susceptibility to the Antiviral Remdesivir GS5734 is mediated by the viral polymerase and the proofreading exonuclease. This was actually published in 2018. So GS5734 is just another name for remdesivir. When a host cell comes into contact with the coronavirus known as SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 infects the cell by a certain mechanism. So the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus has proteins on its surface. These are what we call spike or S proteins. 
these S proteins allow the binding to the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface of a host cell. So once the S protein on SARS-CoV-2 binds to an ACE2 receptor on the host membrane, the host cell membrane actually invaginates. And that invagination process actually closes over and it actually brings in the coronavirus in what we call an endosome. And then that endosome is brought into the cell and oftentimes fuses with a lysosome. This is the process known as endocytosis. So what happens is that that coronavirus exits out of the endosome or the lysosome and unravels its viral RNA. So the viral RNA is the genetic code of the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. SARS-CoV-2 virus is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. So it's one strand of genetic code. This is what makes up the virus. Once the viral RNA is inside the cell, it hijacks the host cell's machinery, like ribosomes. Ribosomes are protein makers, so you can think of them like that. And they look at this piece of viral RNA and they make a protein, they translate it into viral proteins. One of those proteins is what we call RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RDRP. RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, as its name suggests, it is dependent on RNA, so it needs RNA to function, and an RNA polymerase means that it makes RNA. So what it actually does is that it actually makes more viral RNA. So it looks and reads this piece of viral RNA to make more viral RNA. That is its function. These SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA are also used to produce other viral proteins like spike or S proteins that coat the viral envelope. And eventually, all of these viral proteins and the pieces all come together to produce new virus, new SARS-CoV-2 virus, that then can exit the cell to infect other cells as well. Now that we know how the SARS-CoV-2 virus can bind and enter and infect, cells, how does remdesivir work? So when we give remdesivir via IV, remdesivir can then enter into the cell and then be metabolized to its active form, GS441524. Remember that GS441524 is an adenosine analog, which means that it looks and acts like adenosine, but it really isn't true adenosine. Now, I didn't mention this before, but viral RNA, like our own RNA and our DNA, are made up of nucleotide bases. There are four nucleotide bases that are used, and they are slightly different in RNA compared to DNA, but in RNA, they are A, G, C, and U. So adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Those are the four nucleotide bases. GS441524 is an adenosine analog. Adenosine is a nucleoside. So what's important here is that GS441524 acts like, but is not the same as the A piece on RNA. So the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RDRP, gets a bit confused. It thinks that this GS441524 is the A piece that is supposed to be used for making viral RNA. So it makes a mistake. It picks this piece up and incorporates it into the viral RNA strand. What happens is, so you can think of this piece here as the GS441524, as it's producing the viral RNA, it adds onto the viral RNA this wonky piece. And this piece is not supposed to be there. So what happens is this becomes defective. This viral RNA becomes defective. In fact, it usually causes the RDRP to stop producing the viral RNA after a couple more additions to the RNA. So we get defective and essentially inactive viral RNA. It's not able to do what it's supposed to do. That's how remdesivir and GS441524 enact its antiviral effects by inhibiting viral RNA production. Now there's another piece of this puzzle that I didn't talk about yet, and that is something we call three prime, five prime exoribonuclease, or XON. This is actually also produced 
from the original viral RNA template. So it is a viral protein. And what this exoribonuclease does is it actually detects and fixes problems in the viral RNA strand. So you can imagine that if the RDRP is making the viral RNA and it adds a piece that's not supposed to be there, you've got this little piece of machinery from the virus that is detecting that problem and then fixing it. So it actually can detect the issue and actually remove that piece, that analog, to allow the RDRP to continue to make normal viral RNA. So this exoribonuclease actually goes against the effects of remdesivir or GS441524. So very interesting, this exoribonuclease has been shown to be a part of the viral RNA of coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2. So this is also a very important part of all of this mechanism. Nonetheless, this article here utilizing a murine or mouse model of a coronavirus similar to SARS coronavirus shows that remdesivir leads to decreased loads of viral RNA. So it decreases viral RNA production. That's what we want. What was also found was that remdesivir with a mutant non-functional or less functional exoribonuclease leads to even more of a antiviral effect, causing even less viral RNA to be formed. And we can also see that with increased remdesivir concentrations, we get the same effect. So remdesivir seems to overcome the exoribonuclease's activity, and it can lead to even further robust decreases in viral RNA. However, with these findings, there's also been another possibility that has been raised, and that possibility is that a mutation in the exoribonuclease, the proof reader, may give coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2 resistance to remdesivir. So what that means is that exoribonuclease, or the proofreader, might gain a mutation allowing it to detect the adenosine analog even better. So it might be able to detect that adenosine analog we talked about in the last slide, and it might be able to detect it better and remove it better and prevent remdesivir from even having any effect. So that is something we have to think about as well. In a brief overview of what we know so far, comes from this article here, current knowledge about antivirals, remdesivir, and GS441524 as therapeutic options for coronaviruses. So we have seen so far that remdesivir has been shown to have antiviral effects against SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV in in vitro studies in human respiratory epithelial cells. Again, in vitro means that it's in a petri dish, in a cell culture plate, and it has not been shown in humans. In vivo mice models have demonstrated some protective benefits of remdesivir against MERS-CoV, with remdesivir-treated mice having reduced lung damage and better overall lung functioning versus controls. But again, this is an in vivo mouse model. So in vivo means that it is in a live organism, but it is only in mice, and it is looking at remdesivir's antiviral effects against MERS-CoV, or the coronavirus that causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So we can use some of this evidence, but it is not entirely applicable to humans infected with SARS-CoV-2. And then there is also another in vivo study using rhesus monkey models that have also shown that treatment with remdesivir, including prophylactically, which means that they are given the remdesivir before they are infected with the virus, reduces viral loads and improves lung functioning. So again, it's an in vivo live study. It's in monkeys, so it's not humans. And again, this wasn't with SARS-CoV-2. Right now, there's actually a National Institute of Health clinical trial of remdesivir to treat COVID-19 ongoing. Does it lead to significant improvements in health outcomes in humans infected with SARS-CoV-2? So only time will tell at this point. So I really hope you found this lesson helpful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.